Hey, welcome to Rainbow Table. I'm glad you could join us today. My name is Deb Pierce, and I'm going to be your host for today's show, like I am for every Rainbow Table. So glad you could be here. There are a lot of choices online these days, especially with this staying at home business. So we're glad you chose us, and you do choose us on Fridays at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So uh, what brings me to be your host here, Free Gals Rainbow Table? Well, I have an extensive history in radio, television, media, comedy, singing, drag kinging, celebrity impersonation, uh, improv, um, and I uh, really like women. So I think that really covers all the things that <laughs> make me a good host for this show. We are getting so much love and so much feedback. Don't let it stop. If you haven't joined our Facebook group yet, we're just over 700 members. You are welcome at this table anytime. So join the Rainbow Table Facebook group. You can find it easily. You can also find it through a gal's Facebook group as well. So today's topic, we have covered a multitude of topics, including sex, where we got about 6,000 views. So that tells me where your mind's at. Today we're talking about untold stories. There are so many unsung heroes, untold stories, uh, people that if you geographically, for example, I live in Ontario, uh, there's a couple we're going to be speaking to in just a few minutes who have made waves, laws, love, perseverance part of their mantra. And we're going to speak to them in just a few minutes. And then today's very extra special guests are Farron and Jerry Rogers. Now, Farron is a Cree Ojibwe, French-Canadian lesbian who uh, whose songwriting skills have been compared to that of Van Morris and Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. Um, and then Jerry Rogers, who was um, an advocate for, for women and uh, abused women, became a politician, then became a documentary filmmaker. The two of them made up, met up and of course, Jerry Rogers has done Girl on a Road, which is a documentary about Farron. So uh, I met up with them a little bit earlier and we're going to have a long conversation about them and uh, I cannot wait to for you guys to see that. So um, I have to be honest though, there was something that didn't quite make the cut and I have to tell you now because it was so funny. When we had recorded this um, a few days ago, we were talking afterwards about, you know, symbols and how when they weren't queer spaces, how you would pick up somebody that, you know, you wanted to let them know that you were interested in them. And it was very interesting for me because uh, at the time there was one bar called the Rose Cafe. Well, there was the Women's Common as well, but there was the Rose Cafe. So if you were, you know, at another place or a park or a party or whatever, you maybe pull out your rose matches. And if they don't see that you're like, hey, what kind of music do you listen to? And then they answer, what do you listen to? And I'm like, I don't know, like the Indigo Girls, Farron. And that was code for I'm a dyke. So I asked Farron that question off camera. I wish that I had it recorded. I, w I said to her, I said, so I use your name to name drop to be like, hi, I'm on this team. What did you do? What did you, what did you, you know, say to pick up people? And she's like, uh, she would say, hi. I'm Farron, <laughs> which I thought was amazing. So you're going to hear from that interview in a few minutes. Uh, right now, we're going to be going to Montreal to meet with the cutest, sweetest couple. I saw them in the waiting room uh, um, a little earlier. Roger and Theo, please come on to the show today to talk about your untold story. Hello. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi, you guys. Thank you for joining Rainbow today from Montreal. How are you? We are fine. It's uh, nice and warm, but inside it's nice and cool. So Okay, good. Fine. All right. Well, I feel like I could talk to you for like a sleepover and a weekend, but uh, we've got a few minutes to talk to you about your extraordinary life together. I'm going to introduce you to viewers, and uh, I want to say that you've been a partnered for 45 years. 40, you were asked to, how many, 47? 47, Roger corrected me on that this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. See, you're on it. Okay, 47, time flies when you're in love. 47 years, okay. And you were asked by Quebec to be the first couple uh, part of the civil union law in 2000, 
and two, tell me how that phone call came about. Well, we, we became very well known because of our huge fight against homophobia in our neighborhood. And we had become so well known that the gay community felt we should be the first couple to be married. So you're making reference to a year earlier in 2001 when upwards of 4,000 people came to protest? Yes, uh, correct. Okay. All right, so let's talk about let's talk about that first and then we'll talk about your blessed day and then we'll talk about your stupid neighbor. Yes. All right, let's talk about let's talk about your protest. Well, in the 1997, a new neighbor came to live across from us and he canvassed on the whole street that he wanted the gay people to leave in front of his house. We came to know that through a friend who lived down the street. He came to warn us what was happening. And then uh, he managed to have our direct neighbor on his side. And this direct neighbor started to attack us um, verbally at first. And then it was just a nightmare. It has lasted us for 11 years that we were harassed. He was stalking us all day long until we went to bed at night. It and he even, I, am I to understand that he even had his, had his children, uh, there were children on the street also yelling homophobic slurs at you, is yes. that correct? We, we had a whole slur of damage done to the house, fire thrown on the house. We had bricks thrown through the car windows, uh, a dead rabbit at Christmas time and thrown in the front door. A dead a, rabbit? A dead rabbit, yes. And it went on and on and on. And the house pelted with eggs, raw eggs. And until we, one night we came back home and I had seen this little gang at the grocery store and I said to Roger, they are going to pass by. And they did. And was that the night that threw the fire on the house? Yeah. So he jumped in the car and we ran after them. They ended up the next street where there is a, a church uh, it's a sect called the Veterans, and they disappeared in the church. And we were on the phone with the police, and seven police cruisers came. And all these young punks, they got into a big van that was stationed there, and they disappeared. The police never got. You know, the 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 community. There was a service that night. They put them in, in this truck and they, they drove them somewhere else. So then the police uh, told us to, to go home. And we came home and, and with that case, we went to the Human Rights Commission and it, was, it ended up to be a court case, which eventually we won. Yes, and, and they were, that, neighbor, that neighbor was forced to pay you $12,000. Yes. Um, and as a couple, I mean, this could have gone two ways. This could have torn you apart or brought you closer together because this kind of stress really uh, it, it can take a toll on a couple. Had, did you guys ever think that's it? We're moving. No, no absolutely Good. not. I love because that. I love we that. We had invested so much energy in, in this little house we had bought plus this garden, which is our passion, and we were not going to leave it for no devil whatsoever. So uh, we stayed and, and eventually he was obliged to leave. So in 2009, we came to a, a settlement and he had to leave. And since that time, the house was still there, it had two different owners so far and last week i know tore them down yay on my, on my 
my God, we were so happy. That's exciting uh, because that energy, regardless of who lives in it, right? Those memories, the conditioning, it's almost a, you know, a Pavlovian response. Every time you drive down the road, you're sort of expecting that, even though you know that jerk is long gone. Yes. Uh, so the house is gone. Even looking out my side window where the house is in our face, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It is really like... Now the best part is I met the new neighbors who are building a bungalow and the lady is from Holland, so which is great <laughs> for me. Are you Dutch by any chance? And, yes. Okay. <laughs> Canadian. And, yeah. And the father came to talk to me and he said, Oh, you will have no trouble with us because my son is gay. So, you be your. That is incredible. You know, this story is uh, it's empowering and it really, the word that we, come, we came up with, the team, when we were talking to you, and they're just. The uh, the Agal Rainbow Table team is just so enamored and so in love with, with both of you. But the word perseverance, of course, comes up, right? We don't want to just be tolerated. We don't want to be, we need to have these same rights and protections. Exactly. And your perseverance is so inspiring and so beautiful. So that, okay, so that's one little sort of chapter of your very exciting 47 years together. Uh, and they, that uh, that jerk ended up having to pay you uh, money. I hope you had a very big party and bought yourself some fancy clothes with that money. <laughs> I well, hope you bought yourself a big gay rainbow, actually. That's what I hope you got, a big flag with that. Um, one of the second things, so so uh, in talking about this and, and getting some acknowledgement around this homophobia and abuse, you had that protest well attended in 2011. Of course, you became a very public profiled couple so when Quebec changed their civil union law in 2000, and there it is, um, that's not the wedding day, but that's the protest. Yeah. Um, so in 2002, you got married. Now, I'm going to ask you two things. Did you ever think that in your lifetime, because I know you've seen more than me, did you ever think in your lifetime you'd be able to marry your life partner? And secondly, how did that day go for the two of you? What a beautiful day. Well, we never, we never really thought that we would ever get married, and we didn't really look to get married, but when the law came, <laughs> we accepted the invitation to do so, because that gave us a lot of protection in the future. As a married couple, you have more rights than if you would stay single, Am I still on? Yes, I'm still on. So, yes, yes, yes. We're just showing some pictures of your big day. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. It's very fancy back me. It's very technical, okay? It's, yeah, it's all happening. So um, our marriage was uh, organized in the gay village. Uh, there was a, a big bar, and the owner decided he was going to throw the party for us. So... Um, who has a, a wedding reception at Sky Bar? I mean, who does that? That's I have some memories. I have some memories there. That's phenomenal uh, for anybody that's been in Montreal. Sky Bar, like that's yes, that's and incredible. He organized entertainment on four or five floors from the from the rooftop to the bottom. We had uh, jazz mu musicians. We had famous singers from Quebec. The gay and lesbian choir came to sing for us. We had drag queens doing their thing. And uh, it lasted and lasted by midnight. Roger and I, we were so tired. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be the first to leave your party. <laughs> yeah. and oh, that's incredible. And so, was, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was invited and the owner, the drinks were free on all the floors. There were about 50 number of people who showed up that day at our wedding party. So it was really uh, an unbelievable day. 
That is what an honor. You know, it's very, there's a few life lessons to live with the, um, the pride and every pun intended, but the pride that the two of you, Roger and Theo as a Theo, as a couple, there's so much to take from how love can really conquer so many things. We're putting up an image here. Um, uh, Love can conquer so many things. And the fact that it didn't occur to you as a couple, I suspected that I knew the answer to that question, but the fact that it didn't occur to you as a couple to cower from that or let that person quote unquote win uh, against the death threats and the arrests and the, you know, the dead animals on your doorstep to know as a couple that you were like, heck no, we're not going anywhere. And then for that to turn around and then be honored uh, we hear from Donna here. Congratulations, congratulations on 47 years together, Thea and Roger, and for being the first same-sex couple married in 2002. Let's see if there's more comments because people are talking to you here. Oh, there's a lot of comments that I have been blatantly not see. Wow. Okay. There's a lot. People, people are loving at you. Um, Larry just wants you to know that uh, he's sitting in a shady backyard in Halifax. So uh, Halifax Pride is coming up shortly. So happy almost Pride there. Hello, uh, this is Dennis from St. Catharines. They want to say hi to the two of you. Um, uh, they love, Egal loves your colorful shirts. I love that you have kind of matched yourselves. You both have shades indoors. It's very, it's very happening. I think you might have very similar facial hair. It's pretty cute. Uh, Grimsby, Ontario, we have Judy watching. Dawn is at home in Calgary. Judy, uh, oh yeah, in Grimsby. Um, Ian Nelson says, life does get better. Uh, did you have a sense that this would kind of turn out like this or did you really have any idea that this there'd be an end to any of this abuse? Well, it, um we was obliged to install four cameras in the front of our house and they are still functioning. So um, our initial homophobe is still living across the street. So, but since we had some run-ins with him with, with, uh, with a court case, he, he stays out of our hair. So we have no problem with him. But the fact remains that it is a daily reminder how he sees us, you know, which uh, it, it bothers us. Uh, I have to say it, it keeps on bothering you if somebody really hates you because you're, you're gay or you're black or whatever. That's right. It, it is just something which gets under your skin. It's something you cannot really digest, I think. Um, well, well, I don't, I don't know this, this, uh, this person that was horrible to you. Um, <clears throat> I suspect that, um, you know, uh, I have my own theories around people that are extremely homophobic, as I'm sure you've heard. Methinks thou doth protest too much. What are you hiding? But uh, that's just me. But um, it has all turned out. You're a beautiful couple. You are a beautiful and perfect example of unconditional love and perseverance. This show, Rainbow Table, is designed exactly for these kind of stories to be shared, and I couldn't be more thrilled to have met you today. I'm going to I'm going to end on telling uh, everybody that you two have written a book, and uh, I'd love you to just talk about that for a second before we part ways for the day. Yes, we we have written a, we have written a book about a, a tree which we dug out on the side of the road. It's it's a Actually, it, it is more of a wheat than a tree. And f for a long time, we thought it was a, um, a sumac. And then it turned out to be this uh, called the tree of heaven. And <clears throat> when the tree died, we were so fond of this little tree, we decided to paint it. When it, when it completely died, we painted it red, and it is now a sculpture in the garden. So That's beautiful. We just couldn't get rid of it, and we wrote a book about it, uh, all the stages of that little tree who was just a little thing, you know, when we planted it. And uh, that's, our garden is like that, and all the plants and whatever, we uh, just 
then they wouldn't get it. You know, it's all Canadian native uh, stuff we have. They beautiful. beautiful. By the way, people should pay more attention what grows in Canada. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, the two of you have got some time to do that together now, not looking over your shoulder like you were at one point. Uh, I'm going to close off with one of our viewers says his name's Larry and he says many thanks for such an inspirational story. I couldn't have said it better myself. Perseverance is uh, is the, the word of the day here for you guys. Roger, Theo, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts here at Rainbow Table. Thank you. We enjoyed being on your show. Me too. I want to have a drink with you at Sky Bar someday. Well, uh, you're welcome here in the house. We can serve you here. <laughs> well, no need to ask me twice. I'm on my way. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Stay well. Be safe, you guys. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, my goodness. They're amazing. What an inspiration. Janet. Yeah, Richards. Thank you. Hello and thank you. Uh, they'll be seeing this. They're still in the back room. Wow, if you're just joining us, Rainbow Table today, we're talking about untold stories. Not an untold story now. What a couple. What an inspiring couple. Love can really persevere, quite literally, through anything and a positive, loving outcome. So uh, our next untold story is I'll do the introduction and then we're going to flip to a video that we actually pre-recorded to get everything happening all at once. Um, but I wore the same shirt that I wore for that interview, and I just realized I'm not wearing the same necklace. Meh, whatever. Okay, our next untold story is going to be Farron, uh, who is known to have influenced the likes of Ani DeFranco and the Indigo Girls. I mentioned earlier, in case you're just uh, tuning into Rainbow Table here. Hi, I'm Deb Pierce. Welcome. Um, uh, Farron is a Cree Ojibwe French Canadian lesbian and an incredible singer and a songwriter whose talents in songwriting have been compared to that of Van Morrison, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. And then Jerry Rogers is also going to be on the screen with me, so it's gonna be the three of us. Jerry Rogers started out uh, helping abused women, got into politics, got out of politics, and uh, is a documentary filmmaker. She did My Left Breast, she did a documentary about the Montreal Massacre, and then of course the pairing of Farron and Jerry Rogers, they did a documentary that we're, you're going to hear us talk about called Girl on a Road. I introduce to you here on Rainbow Table for your viewing pleasure, Farron and Jerry Rogers. Hey, and welcome to a very special show today on Rainbow Table. I am your host, Deb Pierce, and I will be interviewing two very juicy individuals normally i do the introduction before they come on screen but they're already here to hear me talking about them so uh on your bottom left well my bottom left corner is jerry rogers now jerry rogers has an eclectic career hello jerry i'm going to talk about you while you're here okay yeah that that right. you know uh, that happens a lot does it okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right uh and so you're very well accomplished as a documentarian um, you had a foray in politics that we were going to talk about that you have uh, stepped back from. Uh, early years, you actually uh, created and started a, a safe space for women uh, with um, your, you grew up and then came back to Newfoundland. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. All right. You never actually leave Newfoundland though, do you? Um, no. And then we also have, I have the great honor of interviewing, speaking to and talking with and I wanted to sing with, but it's not going to happen. We have the wonderful and talented Farron. Farron, welcome very much to be, for being here. Thank you very much. I'm so thrilled. I can't even tell you. So when we were in the waiting room and Jonathan was being all technical, I was like, oh, my God, Farron, you were the first, like, real butch that I ever saw. I was like, now that is a butch. I, that I love you and I cannot tell you how formative your music and poetry I call it uh, have got me through some very interesting times so I just want to get that out of the way I'm totally fanning on you but thank you very much for everything all right all right uh, okay so um, there's so much to talk about uh, with both of you so the reason why the two of you are on here uh, Farron Canadian singer signed for a few years uh, did lots of tours pulled back from music for a few years, 
And then, as I previously mentioned, Jerry Rogers documentarian and yourself as a musician, this came together in a beautiful amalgamation called Girl on a Road. So before we get really into that part of it, I want to talk to you guys about, um, did you feel it was inevitable given your life, your life and what you did and the things that you did and the topics, uh, Jerry, that you covered uh, and have covered in your documentaries? Did you at all think it might be inevitable that two, the two of you might work together? And um, how did you actually meet? Who wants to go first? Do you want me to tell that story, Farron? I, I, this is the story I, that I would love to tell. Well, and, and first of all, who hasn't been in love with Farron? When you say that, who hasn't? Who hasn't? And you know how often by the right and by homophobes that um, we would be uh, accused of proselytizing, you know? But Farron, all you had to do is put Farron on a stage, let her sing, and lesbians were created. It's like putting water on <laughs> seeds, you know, it's just so fabulous. It's but true. Um, people went in there heterosexual and came out totally queer. That's what happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was no point in resisting, right? right, right. Uh, even men, even men became lesbians. I have That's a good right. friend, Rob Ritter, who loves Farron. But uh, yeah. That's um, amazing. A, a, my partner Peg, my next of skin, um, she, her cousin, had a tragic, tragic fire at her home uh, in BC, in Vancouver, and uh, she was uh, organizing the uh, funeral for her. She had uh, a child that died in the fire, and she um, used to sing, uh, I've Never Been to Africa. And she used to sing that to her child and she used to change the words. And she contacted me and she said, what do you think? Do you think Farron, do you know how to get in touch with her? I want her to know that I'm going to sing that at, at my uh, child's funeral, but I want to know, I want Farron to know that I've changed the words a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll contact Farron, I'll find her. And I contacted Farron and I said, told her the story and I said, um, you know, she's going to be doing this in St. John's and Farron was in, you were on Galliano then, were you? I mean, not, not Galliano, uh, yeah, Saturna. And uh, Farron thought that I was saying the funeral was at St. John's church in, in Vancouver. And she said, yeah, I'll, I'll come and sing this on. And I said, but it's in, it's in Newfoundland. It's in St. John's, Newfoundland. Arguably and the furthest point from what you're making reference to. Yes. I thought, gee, you know, wouldn't it be great if Farron could come? And I said, Farron, if we can get you to St. John's, do you want to come? And she said, yeah. And Farron came and sang at the funeral. I know I'm getting like it was the most it was the most incredible thing and of course most of us who who aren't who aren't 20 year old dykes Farron's music was the soundtrack to our lives she was there when we broke up she was there when we celebrated she was there when we were marching in the streets she was there in our activism and I never thought I was going to get this Wheaton, but, um, and that was the beginning of our collaboration. Farron, I don't know if that's how you remember it, but, um, and Farron came with her then partner at the time and hung out in Newfoundland. Gee, Farron, I think you were here for about a week or two weeks, Hey, It was just fabulous. And we got to know each other. And that's when I said, Farron, you want to make a film and that's how we started Baron, how do you remember that story yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful that says everything about you that we already well uh so then i watched uh jerry's my left breast and i was so moved by it and the the bravery and that kind of getting rid of the fourth wall uh, the i don't know what it was it was so intimate and i thought yeah, this this could be good because 
like I, I wasn't interested in too much glitz. I wanted to get down to why bother. So <laughs> we got there. And so um, I didn't really. Uh, I, 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 I'm assuming that everybody knows everything about you. I'm not going to do that with you, Farron. I'm going to give people some history. If you're just tuning in right now, you're watching Rainbow Table with Jerry Rogers and Farron. Uh, Farron, you've been compared to the songwriting of Springsteen and Leonard, Co uh, Leonard Cohen. Um, you were signed briefly to Warren Brothers for two years in the mid-90s. The contract was supposed to be for seven years and three records, but was terminated early by the label, despite it being uh, the dawning of a new era. Of course, that was the timing of Lilith Fair. Uh, for groundbreaking uh, music again for women, um, and it says here when I when I look about the, uh, to this, it says mainstream success eluded her, or you or or you eluded it. Um, even even you're not entirely sure. So when you think about the accolades that you have as, and I do see you as a po a, a poet. I know that it's set to song and music, but the way you speak, you strip yourself naked, you open yourself up and you show us your experiences. And yet I know that there's something about you that's coveting and protecting that throughout the entire time. It's, it's so vulnerable what you do musically. Um, and so success can be monetary, success can be how you feel within your accomplishments. What does success mean to you? When we talk about Warner labels, there is that monetary success that comes with that but what does success look like for you um success looks like that i ended up having a life you know i made a life and i didn't have to contradict myself and could continue moving forward and you know some of what went on with warner brothers was really hard it was really hard for me to take and i'm i mean i think probably the the incident that probably just just broke us is that <clears throat> for Lilith Fair, um, with Emmy, Emily and like the Indigo Girls and uh, Sarah McLaughlin and well, I can't remember who was else was on that night, but it was basically all the people who had loved me. I don't know if Sean Polin was there, but Warner Brothers wanted me to stand. Listen, I even sound arrogant even trying to talk about it. They wanted me to stand by the gate where you pay your ticket and sing as people were coming in. Aye. And, um, you know. <laughs> you know, as much as artists don't want to let ego play a part of it because you're artists, seriously, that is, that is a kick to the chops and that is an insult. I mean, the fact is, is if anybody had gone to the girls on the stage and told them that I was out there going to have to sing, you know, they would have stopped that. But it didn't get that far, right? Because I right. just stood up and I, I'm not doing it. And he's like, why? You know, you have to work, you have to do. And I said, yeah, well, uh, and he's gay. He was gay. I said, come on, what about gay pride? I mean, I'm not... I am not the one standing out there. No. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'll learn after I die that that, that was a stupid thing to say. But at the time, I I, the other yeah. thing that happened is leave the Village Voice wrote about Ricky Lee, who at another situation, Lollapalooza or something like that, they put her down on the ground with the audience, with the big stage behind her and got her to sing in between gear change. And Ricky Lee Jones? Wrote, Ricky Lee Jones, yeah. And the guy wrote the article and he just said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, you know, or seen. She should never have been down there. And she's, anyways, so I had happened to read that lot a few weeks earlier. And so all of a sudden just thrown at me in it and I just thought, for every lesbian and every gay person and everybody who's trying to become who they think they really are, I'm not doing it. Good. So that kind of Good. You know what the answer is. You don't have to wait till the next life to figure that out. You already know what the answer is. Yeah, I just want to say the best thing that happened out of that, a few weeks later, there was a review of Lilith Fair 
and I'm sad, you know, and I'm reading the whole thing and I'm not in it and I'm singing right down to the bottom. I wish I could remember who it was. Maybe it's a Golden Mail guy. He just said, but where was Farron? Oh, well, there's your just desserts. You know, they say revenge is best served cold. That was pretty, uh, that was pretty lukewarm. Very good. <laughs> All right, so we know a little bit about Jerry Rogers. We know a little bit about Farron. You can please look these humans up. They're so well accomplished and beautiful and we don't have time to get into, you know, a docu-series of all the beautiful things. So uh, we talked about Farron being a Canadian a singer and Jerry Rogers uh, had a foray in politics, which I'm sure you made great changes in Newfoundland, uh, always working in and around affordable housing and women's rights, which is wonderful. So the inevitable happened. Perhaps it was the passing of your friend's daughter that made that happen, but nevertheless, it happened. And after 10 years, you and your band members reunite for a three island, three concert tour. Uh, the film follows you through the rehearsal at your little house, which is great. I saw, I saw the trailer and you're shoving all your things out of the way so that the you know little drum kit can fit or whatever. Uh, and then uh, Jerry follows you on Saturna Island to the road. So part mm -hmm. of your performances are, are, are talking about your life and songs. One of you, please start walking me through the process of the first moment when you started shooting. What was what was that moment like and, and where were you? Was it actually the beginning of the, was it shot in series in a, a chronological order? I'll just say, well, there because there was a logical order. We had to meet. That would be the first thing. And so I remember hey, all the best. Right? We hadn't met, you know, because after Warner Brothers, we needed like a seven year break to recover. And they all came off the ferry. That's what what, what it was. Everybody came off the ferry with hats on. Remember that? And oh, yeah. Jerry, yeah, Jerry was there. I'm looking at everybody. They all got hats. I guess they were trying to be snazzy. But, uh, <laughs> so that, and, and then we drove up to the house to start a very rapid rehearsal. Like it was a one day rehearsal just to get all the and how many how many songs do you think you were rehearsing in that time to sort of pare it down for like a, a set list was it sort of these are the yeah. ones we're going to rehearse and these are the ones we're going to play no no we, we only rehearsed to know what to play right right so, you know this about the film so yeah very very fast. we all ate good we laughed we talked we had a lot of jokes and also Rehearsed a show that the next morning we then went on a ferry into uh, Victoria, I think. Yeah. And Jerry, how many people on your crew were shooting were shooting the documentary? How many? How many were you? We were a huge, huge crowd. It was uh, myself and Peg, my next of skin. Uh, okay. So uh, it was basically Peg and myself. And, but when we were in Vancouver, we also uh, hooked up for the show in Vancouver. We had two, two or three other people who who helped shoot that particular concert. But other than that, Peg basically shot everything. I shot a little bit. I sometimes boomed. But I was going to say, there's two of you. One's holding the boom. One's yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was really a, a very compact team. Now, when, when people were hiring you for this tour, was it under the guise of it, it will be part of a documentary, or was that just an added bonus when, you know, a, a film crew of two came in afterwards? Did, did you let the, the venues know? I don't remember any of that. That would be Jerry's territory. I don't know that we did. Maybe I said something from the stage at the end or something, but right. I don't remember that. Yeah, you remember right. Jerry? You know, it was, well, it was, it, it, it was a Farron and her band reunion that Farron had produced. You actually produced it, didn't you, Farron? And pulled it together and booked three concerts and all of them were sold out. And, I'm sure. Um, and, but also Farron had arranged to have it very beautifully, beautifully recorded for the possibility of a CD coming out of out of uh, this tour, and um, doing the recording, he was so good. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know that's the music we used uh, for the film as well, and uh, um, and as I've gotten older, 
because I have gotten older and when someone approached me to say, would you be willing to be in this series for senior dykes? And I thought, man, or senior queers, I thought, I guess I am a senior. Um, but uh, I have, uh, my filmmaking has become much more personal, intimate, and smaller crews. I mean, I used to work in film with big professional crews with lighting people and camera and assistant camera and sound and assistant sound and a producer, et cetera. And now I love the flexibility, the versatility, and the potential for intimacy with a smaller crew. Although the, the, uh, the interviews with Farron, and I, and I always feel that I never make a film about someone, I make a film with someone. And my role as a documentary filmmaker was to get out of the way and to allow, in this case, Farron's voice, Farron's story to, to come through in a way that, uh, you know, I never use narration or anything, but in a way to allow Farron to be as close to the audience as possible. And to not, we didn't want to use any artifice. We didn't want to use any back history stuff. Um, basically, you know, as you said, Deb, you know, a lot of the stuff about then there was this record and then there was that record. And then, you know, in the chronological time, a lot of that is available online, but I wanted people to have the experience of fair and uninterrupted. And so that's what we did. Great. That's beautiful. Girl, girl uninterrupted on a road. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> that was the first working title. I get that. Uh, and so, so Farron, you do open up uh, with your, with your poetry, with your music, with your songwriting, you open up to us on such, uh, such a vulnerable level. How does it feel when you're not behind a mic and a guitar? How, how is there a sort of a different, is there a Farron that sings and performs and a Farron that I could sit on a couch with and talk to? Are, are you sort of different about holding your cards closer to your chest or are you just always forthright with how you're feeling about things? Um, you know, I hope I am forthright. Uh, I, I think, I think there's not too much ripple between me on the stage and off. It's just, I'm not singing, you know, but I, I don't know, Jerry, you, you are with me. So it's hard to talk about yourself. I know. Isn't it weird? I, but I really want you to, because we love you and we want to hear it. I have an intention to keep some things hidden. I mean, we all have pain and sorrow and regrets. And I mean, there's no, you can't expose them most of the time. You know, I do remember being at a dinner with a whole bunch of lesbians and all of a sudden blurting out that I'd been raped. And it was a showstopper, let me tell you. And nobody talked about it. There was a beat and then we went on. <laughs> right. So, okay, I get it. You know. It's interesting, and, and in a room full of, uh, you know, some sisters like that, I'm surprised that they didn't, like, just all want to just envelop you and, and make you feel better and hug you and, you know, hold you in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the timing was off, but for some reason it just kind of blurted out of me. I don't know why. It's like, all of a sudden I thought, I have a safe place or something, you know. Not that I wanted to process the whole thing while we're eating salad, but, you know. <laughs> I was in Michigan. When you're talking about being on stage and people eating salad, I think about Mishfest. I don't know if that's where it was. Yeah, I wanted a seamless shift between what what I am. I mean, the guy when I'm touring with the guys or something, they remark on that that one minute we're backstage or we're hanging out, and then next minute I'm on the stage, and they don't even know how how it happened that I am all of a sudden there in doing that energy minute ago I was just sitting down but I don't think there's a problem you know what I mean because I I didn't fake it too much no I don't suspect you did I don't suspect you did uh and so if we can kind of peel back the onion a little bit to talk about your songwriting I know you picked up a guitar it says uh and correct me if the world wide web is wrong at all but it sounds like you were a teenager when you started to pick up the guitar um and the songwriting process for you it's different for everybody 
do you sit down to write a song? Does a song come to you in your sleep? How is that process? And some of your songs are between three and more than three minutes. So that's why I call them these, they're sort of vignettes in my mind. There's their stories, their poems, their loves, love stories, they're devastatingly heartbreaking. What is the songwriting process for you? Is it different per song? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I had a couple of years in the mm, early 80s, middle 80s, where you know, I was writing every day and I was like, everything was pouring out of me and that's the beauty of you. And, um, but then some songs have been harder, harder to find. And now I find I don't look for them even. I just think I have a story to tell and I told it. And also I carried a story of a lot of women. And, you know, I'm 68 years old. I, I don't think I'm going to go on the road again. You know what I mean? Right. Yay. So, <laughs> I mean, it's nice, but it's tiring. So, uh, I am the worst person to talk about my process, I'm telling you. <laughs> and I don't want to reveal anything that you don't want to reveal. But if I were to say to you, it's 2020, uh, life is crazy right now. Um, have you, what, what was the, what, what was the topic of the last song that you wrote about? Um, the last song I wrote, oh, I, remember, um, I had got together with the band and we did a, in, a curious thing. We didn't have any songs or Don, I told Donnie I didn't. Sonny Benedictson from Winnipeg, so bass player and also my producer. So we get the band together for a week and, we, and I think we'll just make music and then later on I will write the words to the music. But actually it turned out that the musicians were more eclectic than than I was. Like with just the jazz and collections and all that stuff was very hard for me to match lyrics to it because I actually kind of write Shakespearean. You know, it's the meter is is there like right. songs. And I guess that's just my natural, I don't know what it is. So um, but anyways, the last song I wrote was I took one piece of music that was so jazz, sultry, night, you know, bar lights and street light. It's just this gritty feeling. And I ended up writing a song. A basic, yeah, I mean, nice. I don't have the lyrics here with me, but. It was very powerful, but I could never sing it. This is jazz. Right. Well, you can always, you know, you can call Leah Deliria. Uh, <laughs> see if she can do that. Actually a good idea. Uh, so Jerry Rogers, if you're just joining us right now, we're talking with Jerry Rogers and Farron. They paired up together a number of years ago to create a documentary called Girl on a Road. Um, so Jerry, you were mentioning earlier, for those uh, who are just maybe tuning in now, you mentioned earlier that um, you sort of have the freedom to uh, choose now uh, the topics that you want to do, which you've done as, as a documentarian, but you do sort of take your, your time with it. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, how you covered the Montreal massacre. I want to talk about that process for you making a documentary, how important that work is. Uh, how, did you get, how did you get through that? Well, I, I was living in Montreal when the massacre happened. As a matter of fact, just a few a few blocks away from the Polytechnique, and uh, someone called me and they said, you know, women are getting killed at the Polytechnique. Someone's shooting women. So I I, I went up to the Polytechnique, and um, there was a lot of media folks calling me from Newfoundland because that's where I'm from, but I was living in Montreal. So calling me and asking me to comment and that, and I thought, no, you know what? I have nothing to say right now. I, 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 we have to figure out what's going on here. We have to yeah. really have a sense. What is this really about? And Louise Lore, who worked at CBC, was the uh, executive producer of Man Alive, who was a CBC weekly show. And she asked me, if I would do a film on violence against women, and it was during a time, it was 
uh, it was about a, a few months after the Montreal massacre and um, where there was a lot of uh, public, uh, public sexual assaults, rapes of women in Toronto. And she asked me if I would do a film on violence against women. And then I thought, I want to try and figure out what is what is our take as 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 feminists. What is our take on on the Polytechnique massacre? And so I suggested that I would do a film for the first anniversary of the Montreal massacre. And um, I had decided that I wasn't really interested in uh, interviewing women who'd been shot and survived. And that I wasn't that interested in, you know, there was talk of oh, these women were martyrs. And I thought, no, they're, they weren't martyrs, you know, that no. Um, so, but somebody, a few friends kept asking me, saying, you've got to meet Sylvie uh, Tremblay. Sylvie was one of the women who had been shot. And uh, you really shouldn't. And I said, you know, that's not the direction I want to go in. But I went to meet Sylvie and I heard her story and I thought her story, and she was so clear and so articulate about the whole issue of violence against women. And um, when she was shot, she, Sylvia is a dyke and she had short hair and was wearing a sweatshirt and jeans. And when she was shot, she uh, fell face forward. And then there was a young woman beside her who was shot, who was in a skirt and, uh, much, you know, Femi, and she fell on her back and the gunman came in between and shot that woman again and didn't shoot Sylvie again. And she'll, Sylvie figures because she looked like she could have been a man and that's why he didn't shoot her again. And I thought that was the embodiment of what happened that day, that evening, that night at the Polytechnique. And so, um, her story was the, the thread of what that film was. And I thought, because it was so important to be able to clear away all the noise and all the stuff right. and let our strong feminist voices come through. Um, A, for those of us to hear from the heart and center of where we were, but also to give in, in, in a very prominent place within the media, that kind of analysis of what happened. And so that's, that's how that happened. And it happened, that film, because of the courage and the wisdom and the generosity of Sylvie Trombley. Yeah. That's amazing. I remember the first year and the second year going to Philosopher's Walk uh, downtown Toronto, just uh, all, you know, just all of us still, it, it never left me. It never left a lot of us. You know, there was a certain age to some of us that were, um, you know, really sort of formative years in our, in our feminism uh, and, and our fight. And uh, yeah, I'll just never forget it. And that's, that's such, that's such great work that you, that you did, you know, sort of, I'm not going to say tackling that topic, but facing that topic and, and, and teaching us about it. And then of course you had breast cancer. So you did my left breast, pretty heavy stuff. And then, uh, life happens and you meet Farron. And I have to say that it was probably, there was probably some levity to girl on a road, uh, the documentary that you made. A little bit different than 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 what you did, and yet still really, I am hearing it about Sylvie and Farron, really getting down to who you are. Who are you? What makes you tick? Let's talk about this. Let's teach the world about who they thought you were and who you really are, I guess, is kind of my takeaway from seeing both. Yeah. And you know, it 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 it's really about, you know, to be a documentary filmmaker is about clearing for me for me is about clearing some space for voices that we are not often that we no, do not often have the chance to hear to clear some space so those voices can emerge and it's you know it's funny because as a as a politician i you know i was a, 
elected in 2011 and, and I decided to run. I never wanted to be a politician, but I was just so pissed off with what was happening in Newfoundland and Labrador at the time. And um, I decided to run and I ran for the NDP and you know, a lot of people never thought I would win. I, I didn't know if I was going to win, but I was just so pissed off because I ran a, 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 against uh, in a, the most powerful and well-loved and well-liked conservative MHA in Newfoundland and, and Labrador. Won. Yes. Well, yeah, and and but and what happened is that I, I said, you know, I would go door to door, and it was like making a documentary film. You'd knock on this door. And you didn't know what was going to happen when that door opened. And right. so my role was to listen, to listen with the intent to really, really hear, to listen to the stories, to listen to the voices. And then as a politician, to clear some space to allow those stories and those voices to be heard. And that's sort of what happened. And also, you know, I was kind of thinking, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to win or not. And then, you know, my focus was always, I'm not running against Sean Skinner. I'm running for the people of St. John's Centre. Mm -hmm. And that became my focus. And, um, and, you know, I'd knock on the doors and people would say, Sean Skinner, but he's a good guy. And I said, yeah, he is a good guy. He's a really good guy. Wrong party, though. It's time <laughs> we, we do something different. But anyway, so I won. And you know, stayed for about eight years, and uh, decided that was enough. But as a politician, I thought always I was I was the first out elected politician in the history of Newfoundland and Labrador, and always felt yeah, I always felt it was so important to yeah. constantly identify myself as a lesbian and as not afraid and uh, tackled uh, some really important uh, issues, managed to get um, trans rights in, enshrined in our Human Rights uh, uh, Act in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, so it was, and I was always thinking about queer youth and trans youth and how important right. it was for them to see someone in our seats of, would have been nice Alex. to have one of you when the three of us were growing up, uh, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. Uh, and so, Farron, before we, and I don't ever want this conversation to end, so when we stop recording, I feel like I still want to talk to you for a very long time. I won't, but I, that's what I want. Uh, and so, was this, so a documentary, a documentarian, documentary filmmaker, uh, approaches you with this, and you, was there any trepidation? Were you like, yes, I'm in, let's do this? Was, what was your thought? Well, I mean, the hardest thing that yeah, probably Jerry had to deal with with me is that I, you know, I don't really like to talk about myself, so that made it difficult for her. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she had to sort of manipulate that, I think. I just wanted to do what we were doing. I was going to sing, and the band was there, and we made this music, and it does its job. It It's about healing. It's about... Uh, acknowledging that we're all together in the same place somehow and it it was great for me to hear from my she surprised me by band members and i didn't know this and so when the film was up cut that was when i saw it and learning about what they thought about me that's interesting to put yourself in that position. That's that's a pretty vulnerable position as well. I don't know. I don't surround myself with people that blow smoke up my uh, but uh, it's good. It's good to know how people really feel about you. And you know, it was and, and it was so beautiful to hear the band members, Donnie and oh, Farron, Daryl, Daryl, yeah, speak about. Farron and her music with such respect and such mm -hmm. love and also you folks were always ha having fun together as well but um and they got you they got your music I think you made them into lesbians too but um you know Daryl would talk about 
the space, the silence in, in Farron's music, which was such, the silence itself in the music was such powerful music. And the thing, you know, Deb, when we hear you talk about, you know, Farron putting herself out there and being vulnerable, but also what happened, I think with Farron's music, it allows all of us, all of us, yeah. to touch our vulnerabilities. It allows all of us to trust because sometimes going with Farron with her music is an act of trust because it's a journey. And um, I think that, um, that your music sometimes, and some of the music, some of the songs just opens us up it just really really opens us up and you go on this journey and maybe you touch places in your own lives through Farron's music that uh it's kind of scary to go to and um and you, you get to go there because the music helps take you there and your music is about healing but sometimes it's about it's a little scary and then when you think like the, the, the testimony like what a song. Farron was, was commissioned to write a song about rape. And, um, and she came up with testimony, which is so empowering and so strong. And Farron was, was starting to say something there, but the audio got cut off. What was your response to that? I just want to say that what I want to tell a little story, which might help because the audience is taking a, a step of trust and we all are, everybody is, when we're playing. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had my band in tears while we're playing songs, while we're recording them. And um, we That's just- That's powerful, man. That's- Go through it, right? So I'm yeah. on stage in Vancouver, and I'm now gonna sing on, and Vancouver's my home. So everybody in the audience, I could mostly see them on the street, right? Now I'm going to tell them the song about wishing that I still, that I had a father, you know, that he had died oh, yeah. and I didn't get to him. And, you know, with my hair standing on the end. And it was raw then because I was just trying to get through the process. And that was the, the song the band had to sort of learn. It was a new song. And during the Vancouver show, I fall apart. And, uh, I don't know what happened, but actually, I think Donnie fell apart too. But I fell apart and I managed to get through the song, but then I'm sobbing uh, under my microphone thing, my head is down, and somebody hands me a napkin, and I go, oh, thank you, thank you very much. And I look up, and it's Jane Sibbery. Just giving me. <laughs> wow. It's just so yeah. touching. I'm just so glad that it, it wasn't just the Kleenex. What she was saying is, you know, you're doing it, you're getting through the process, you know, what she yes. has written. I mean, it could have been anyone give me a cleaner, but it was something else. So I was very touched by that and felt really raw, you know, after you do that and then you still have some show left and it's like you just want to go curl up in a fetal position, but yeah. You know. It's it, it, fair, and it's interesting because, of course, these songs, unless you're, you know, some bubblegum, whatever, pop star on the radio, somebody writes a song for you, you sing, it has no emotional connection, doesn't tug on your heartstrings, doesn't do all that. So your writing is cathartic, it's therapeutic for both yourself, of course, and anyone on the receiving end of it. So I think I was sort of remiss, or maybe until just this moment, where I maybe fail to acknowledge that as the artist, like you're reliving this and going through this again and again and again. I can visit the, uh, you know, the songs that I pick and, you know, if I'm in love, I'm gonna listen to this song. If I've broken up, I'm gonna listen to this song. If I wanna do a sing along, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna listen to Girl in a Row where you're like, sing it. And we all sing, you know, rain on the water. Uh, and so I think, I think this is an important lesson to learn from an artist that, this is your life, these are your stories, these are your moments. We really need to sort of respect that space for you in those moments where you are really having a real life response to your real life, if that makes sense. Yeah, and there will be times when I'm singing, you ask me about my, my writing process where 
maybe it's the 1500th time I've sung our purpose here. And yet, when I'm right in the middle of it, because I write in present tense a lot, because I believe that there's just now, I go through a change. I mean, I'm sure people have seen that look on my face. It's almost like I'm like, oh, I had no idea that I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> Of the revelations in the middle of a <laughs> yo tell you where i lose time the most is on shadows on a dime like you can have it won't take long as long but i don't lose i don't lose psychic time but yep. in shadows on a dime, i always end up in some point thinking did i just sing that verse or you know i get lost you lose yourself in it that's wild yeah Oh yeah, scary. There's, I, imagine I, what it's like for us. Like really, that is a true testament to one of the most brilliant songwriters. This is this is how you're described as a, as a brilliant songwriter. And again, for me, totally a poet uh, that happens to play the guitar beautifully. Um, before we wrap up, I'm going to say uh, I'm going to ask both of you, Jerry, you first, you, and then Farrah, and we'll close off the interview. If there's any one or two or three sentences that you want us to know about you that you don't already know and to be sort of remembered or revered by, uh, in your words, Jerry, how would you, how would you put that into words? These, mm. This is Farron's worst fear because I'm asking her to talk about herself. Uh, but Jerry, let's, let's give it a shot. I love, I love being alive and community is so important to me. And, and, when I look back, when I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, it's so, it's amazing how quickly all this goes and you have so much you want to say. But when I look back over the years, um, how important our queer artists, our trans artists, uh, the work done in culture, how important that has been to so many of us, particularly those of us who grew up in the 50s, the 60s and 70s, when it wasn't safe, when we had to find each other and, and, and secretly find each other and when it took courage. And, but, you know, the books we read, whether it be Patience and Sarah or Catherine V. Forrest or Desert Hearts and, and, and then uh, Fair and Fair and Fair and Fair and again, the, the soundtrack to our lives. And I've heard the mermaid singing and, you know, when the only movies that we saw where gays or lesbians or trans were in movies, it was always a kill them or cure them routine. Somebody was killed or cured. Um, but where we are today, we stand on the shoulders of so many. And again, you know, celebrating uh, Stonewall and, and the, uh, the, the racialized trans women who started that riot. And and uh, how much so many of us have lived through. And I feel so lucky. You know, our, our, our uh, CR groups, our, our protests, our actions, our activism, and, and uh, how hard we work together, whether through the AIDS crisis or the abortion debate. And oftentimes, lesbians were at the forefront of that. Or, you know, our queer community, our trans community, we all were at the forefront of so much of that, whether it even be the civil rights movement and, and, and lesbians of, of, of color and black lesbians who pushed and pushed and pushed on issues of racism. How lucky, how so incredibly lucky I feel and how so incredibly lucky we were to have each other as we went through those those real difficult times, but also those times of celebration, and we danced and we sang and we challenged one another. I, I, damn, I just feel so goddamn lucky. I love that. I feel like applauding. Um, you just took me on such a roller coaster. Then I stop when you're like, and we were lucky to have each other. I'm like, some of us had more of each other than the others, but. That was another. Uh, that was another place I was going to. Uh, Farron, can you answer that question? Or honestly, at this point, if you just want to say anything about anything about anything, please go ahead. But I would. I, I would like to get to a little bit 
if you could, about what you want people to know about you and how you would like to be sort of remembered. Well, you know, uh, when you first started to introduce or about fair and when we were starting this thing, and you called me a butch, and um, I would say that I lived my life all the way along fighting for to express myself in butchdom. And I mean, some of butchdom is caretaking and caring, and some of it is machismo or whatever, but that's not the part I'm interested in. I wanted to be on the continuum of woman. I am a woman. I mean, if you remember the black saying, Nina, I am a woman too, you know, that thing. And I would think, yeah, I'm Bush and ain't I a woman too. And uh, that was just my fight. And, and you guys are old enough to remember that at points, being a Bush was not very attractive. I mean, people were pissed off about shit, you know? But it's just like what the trans are doing now, what everybody's doing. It's like at some point you say, oh, this is the authentic me. That's what I'd like to be known for after I'm long gone, that I was as authentic as I could be considering the circumstances. Thank you. Wow. And some of that took great bravery, right, uh, in the day. Uh, and maybe even in some circles, I know you're in the United States right now, so maybe on a daily basis, when you, if you choose to go out uh, in these troubled times, then that can be an act of bravery in itself uh, ongoing, right? Um, you know, well, when we're all fighting for this and this and this, there's a whole bunch of people that weren't even paying attention. Like, we don't even exist to them. So if I go, you know, to a store and I walk in, I... I perceived as I could walk in with no shirt on and my breasts hanging out, they would still say sir to me. And <laughs> at some point, I, no, that's just not my problem. You know, right. that's your problem. Oh. I love, I love how you're unapologetic and you're authentic and you have led with such uh, empowerment for, for people around you to, and who knows, you know what, if I were really, really to de, you know, really dive into this for myself personally, uh, with my therapist, maybe uh, some of the things that you did and said and some of the circles I was running in listening to your music, maybe you actually, you and very few others, maybe you gave me the strength to be unapologetically me, Farron. So thank you for that. I suspect that there is a, a bit of you in me, in my, I might be a little more abrasive than you. You, sound, you seem quite lovely. I'm a little bit of an agitator. Uh, but there is something in uh, of, of you and me, and I appreciate that very much. And I thank you so much to both of you for your time today. I couldn't be more thrilled and honored for, the, for you to both take some time with me today. There's a quiet street in someone's town. On strangers' feet, I'll mark my ground. I trace my circles round and round. I'm sworn to find thee. In a party scene and I just got loose It's my devil's luck to be introduced To one who takes their shape like you it unbinds me We knew we wouldn't have everything And time proves it true I've got a flat top six dressed in steel strings And I don't have you wouldn't like the life, and I couldn't want you to. Oh, fair and sing to me forever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, that concludes today's Rainbow Table. I'm your host, Deb Pierce. Thank you so much for joining today to our Untold Stories was the subject. Uh, we spoke with Theo and Roger in Montreal. And we spoke with Jerry Rogers. And of course, you just saw the uh, little bit of singing from Farron. Uh, go check out her music on um, anywhere you can find it. Lots of YouTube videos. Uh, there's music on Apple Music and, um, and Spotify. 
Thank you so much for joining us every Friday here at three o'clock. I know the videos keep getting played and that's amazing. I wanna thank so many of you that are mainstays and it's like six for six, you're telling me it's six for six shows. We really appreciate you being here. We're just over halfway through this series. So we hope you stick with us Fridays at 3 p.m. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, please do so. Um, Glenn says, Fair and Really is a songwriter that needs to be included among Canada's greats. I think she is. Um, and uh, so if you want to watch this again, if you there's something you missed or you got a phone call or your Wi-Fi went, eh, then uh, go to the Rainbow Table Facebook group and you can go watch every single episode we've done. Thank you for your time today. Uh, happy Pride coming up for Halifax starting next Thursday. And St. John's Pride is uh, starting today through the 19th. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you so much. And don't forget, there's always a seat for you at our rainbow table. <laughs>